So we're looking this morning at um, John chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to John 21, because we will be looking uh, quite closely at the passage. So we're reading from verses 15 to 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you to lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I'll take these off so I can see you all. So one of my my jobs um, is a GP educator. So I teach consultation skills to GP trainees. And one of the things that we look at after listening really well to the patient is what questions do I need to ask now to find out what matters, to really get to the nub of the problem. And there's not a lot of time in a GP consultation, 10 minutes, sometimes 15 if you're lucky. And so these questions really matter. It's really important to choose the right ones. And in this passage we read this morning, Jesus thinks very carefully about what questions to ask to find out what really matters for Peter. And he chooses the same question and asks it three times. Do you love me? You see, Christianity isn't just a system or a set of values or doctrines or a way of living or even a social club, not just a religion. Christianity is first and foremost a person. It's the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't choose the question, do you know me? Do you know about me? Do you worship me? Do you serve me? Do you trust me? He chooses the question, do you love me? And the more I've been praying and preparing uh, for this message, the more I'm convinced that that is a question he's asking us this morning. It's a question for us as we as a church are looking at undivided hearts. It's his question to you and to me. Do you love me? And that's the message this morning, really. It's not the whole sermon, (laughs) but it is the key message. And if you take nothing else away this morning, please take that question. Do you love Jesus? Think about it respond to it honestly to him because it is the most important thing. And because he asked the question in three ways, I thought we could look at it in three ways as well. So firstly, why? Why would we love Jesus? And why does he expect Peter to love him? Well, 1 John 14, 19 tells us we love because he first loved us. And in Romans, we read, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Peter recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He he says that in Matthew 16. He knows the Messiah is the one who is coming to rescue all the Israelites and rescue all peoples uh, to bring them back into relationship with God. And also in this passage, Peter is in a place where he has failed Jesus. He 
has denied him three times. He's denied even knowing him. And here he is having a conversation with Jesus, who is forgiving him and restoring him. So Peter knows what Jesus has done for him. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? I'm currently reading through the Bible in a year. I'm sure many of you have done that. So I have a passage from the Old Testament, a passage from the New, and and a passage from Psalms. And maybe if you've done that, read through the Old Testament, you're a bit like me. You start off really well. Genesis, the amazing account of creation. Then the first turning away from God as Adam and Eve disobey him. And there are all the consequences of that. We read about people's lives and adventures and stories, and Noah and uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. We hear about the Israelites uh, enslaved in Egypt, the miraculous escape with Moses. And, uh, and it's all fairly easy reading and it's exciting and it's great. And then you get to Leviticus. <laughs> and then it's hard. It's hard going, isn't it? Some years I've tried this, I've not got through Leviticus, that's just me, Bible in a year, out the window. But this year I got through Leviticus. And, uh, and it was interesting because we've been looking at holiness as a church, and, um, and Leviticus is really all about the holiness of God. The, uh, the phrase, be holy as I am holy, is repeated again and again and again. Leviticus really shows us the huge gulf that's created by sin between the holy God and, and his people. And that's why when we read Leviticus, it's so difficult because there's just regulations and rules and cleansing and pages and pages and pages and pages of sacrifices. And it's really hard to get your head around what they're all for and, and, uh, and there just seems to be like endless amounts of them and so much to do just for one priest to go into the Holy of Holies and hear from God one time. And then they have to do it all again for the next time. And as I was reading it, I was thinking, this is a nightmare reading this, but imagine living it. Imagine having to do this just to hear from God. And I think if you, if we see that the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin, and then we see, as Bill talked uh, last week, what Jesus has done. Bill, last week, talked about Deuteronomy and took us to Mount Sinai uh, where we saw the holiness of God and then he took us uh, to that lovely passage in Hebrews where it talks about what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has paid the sacrifice once and for all so there's no need for all those layers and layers and layers of sacrifices and regulations that we can come right into the Holy of Holies ourselves. We can come right into the presence of God again and again. And when we see God's holiness and we see what Jesus has done for us, we can't help but love him. I just want to read a bit um, from this book on holiness by J.C. Ryle. He tells uh, a story of uh, an American Indian follower of Jesus. It's quite old-fashioned language, but I'm just going to read it as it is. So an English traveler spoke to this man and said, what has this Christ done for you that you should make so much ado about him? The converted Indian did not answer him in words. He gathered together some dry leaves and moss and made a ring with them on the ground. He picked up a live worm and put it in the middle of the ring. He struck a light and set the moss and leaves on fire. The flame soon rose, and after trying in vain to escape, on every side the worm curled itself up in the middle, as if about to die in despair. At that moment, the Indian reached out his hand and took up the worm gently and placed it on his bosom. Stranger, he said to the Englishman, do you see that worm? I was that perishing creature. I was dying in my sins, hopeless, helpless, and on the brink of eternal fire. It was Jesus Christ who reached out the arm of his power. It was Jesus Christ who delivered me with the hands of his grace and plucked me from everlasting burning. It was Jesus Christ who placed me, a poor sinful worm, 
near the heart of his love. Stranger, that is the reason why I talk of Jesus Christ and make much of him. I am not ashamed of it because I love him. If your honest answer to the question, do you love me, is no, or not enough, then you need to see again the holiness of God, the seriousness of sin, and what Jesus has done on the cross. Jesus says, I love you this much. Do you love me? And then the other thing we notice, oh, I've lost my pointer, there we are is uh, in verse 15, Jesus says, do you love me more than these? So what does he mean by these? Who are or what are these? So he could mean the other disciples. He could mean, do you love me more than these other disciples do? Some commentators think that's what he does mean here because Peter before Jesus was arrested, had claimed that if everyone else fell away, he wouldn't. He'd be the one that stuck with him. And yet he was the one who denied him three times. And some people think Jesus is saying, so Peter, do you still love me more than these people do? Do you you still think that? Um, So it could be what he means, but as we'll see later, Jesus is being really gentle with Peter in this passage. And this feels more like rubbing salt in the wound, and it's doesn't really fit with the tone of the conversation and doesn't really fit with what I know of Jesus either. So I think it's more about priorities. Because if we imagine them, they're there on the beach. They've just been fishing and had breakfast, um, some fish. And so as they're looking around, there's the boat, there's the nets, there's the fish, and there's the other disciples. And I think Jesus is looking around at all that and saying, Peter, do you love me? more than all these, all these things, all these people. Because Peter had been a fisherman, and yet Jesus had called him to leave his boat and leave his nets and come and follow him, and he would be a fisher of men. But after Jesus died, Peter went fishing. He went back to what he loved, what he knew. He went back to his, what had brought him money and security, The other disciples had gone with him because they saw him as a bit of a leader. They gave him some status and companionship. And Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than all these? Do you love me more than your job, your security, your money, your possessions, your friends, your status? Am I first in your life? Do you have an undivided heart? Ooh, how did that get there? (laughs) Sorry, that is meant to be there. So (laughs) this is our family at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff a few weeks ago for the Wales-Scotland match. This was before, because we're all smiling. (laughs) And you'll see Steve looks particularly happy. He's fat looking slightly manic. (laughs) Um, So why is he so happy? And he's surrounded by what he loves, me, uh, our two boys. He's in Wales. As you can see, we're a bit of a divided family when it comes to rugby. We have two Scots and two Welsh. Steve's one of the Welsh, so he loves being in Wales. We're about to watch live sport, which he loves. And it's rugby, which is the best one. So he's really happy but he has a higher love. There's something he loves more than all that. And none of these things are bad. In fact, it's positively good to love your wife and your family. Not so sure about Wales. (laughs) But, sorry Hugh. but, (laughs) But our love for Jesus should be more. Should be more than all these things. We should love Jesus more than our jobs, more than our hobbies, more than our money, our possessions, our status, our families. Jesus should come first. Why? 
Well, we, as we just said, mainly because he absolutely deserves that devotion. But the other reason is because loving Jesus makes us become the best version of ourselves that we can be. If we put Jesus first, then we become the best version of us. As his wife, do I mind if Steve loves Jesus more than he loves me? Absolutely not. In fact, I know if he does, then he becomes the best husband he could be to me and the best father. And so it is with all of us. If we put Jesus first, we become the best version of ourselves. <coughs> Jesus says, do you love me more than these? We've just sung about that, haven't we? Be my everything. Did you mean it? Do you love me more than these? And how do we know if we love him? I'm not doing very well with this. <laughs> no, that's the wrong one. Lots of ways how we know what we love, but uh, I thought we'd focus on these three. So if we love somebody, we think about them a lot, don't we? I don't know if you remember, if any of you have first fallen in love. You can't focus, can you, at school or at work, because that person is in your head all the time and you can't think about anything else. What's, um, what's in your thoughts? Is it work? Is it planning your next run or your next holiday? Do you find yourself thinking about Jesus, mulling over his word? And then you may have heard the expression, Love is spelled T-I-M-E. We know what we love by how we choose to spend our time and who we choose to spend our time with. Do we choose to spend time with Jesus? Seeking him in the pages of the Bible, seeking him in prayer, just telling him about your day, your worries, listening to him. Do we seek him in worship? Do we seek him as we come together in life groups and in the church and in prayer. One of the reasons Steve and I knew we, were going, we should get married, really, was we just got fed up saying goodbye. We started to hate saying goodbye to each other after spending time together. It just became painful. So we wanted to be together. So if we can go a day or a few days or a week without deliberately setting aside time to be with Jesus. What does that say about our love for him? And then the other way you can tell what people love is they talk about it, don't they? I don't know if you sometimes find it's hard to engage somebody in conversation. You feel like you're asking questions, they're not getting much back. And then you get them on their subject and they're off and you can just go, ah, right, fine, don't need to ask anything else, they're away. Do we talk about Jesus? Is he in our conversation? Is he on our lips? Do you love me more than these? And then the third one, that love should motivate us. Earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. And anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. See, love is a verb, and my primary school grammar tells me a verb is a doing word. Jesus says to Peter, when Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you, feed my lambs. It gives them a job to do. And if we love Jesus, we too have a job to do. If you love me, keep my commands. So our love for Jesus should show in how we live, in what we do and what we don't do. The Bible's full of commands, isn't it? But it's not a pick and mix. It shouldn't be take what you fancy and leave the bits that are too hard and don't fit in with your chosen lifestyle. We should be aiming to obey all of them. But love comes first. Love is what motivates us. That's why I like this quote from John Bloom. He says, habitual sin, so that's the things that we know we should do that we keep on not doing, and the things that we know we shouldn't do that we keep on doing. Habitual sin is not fundamentally defeated through the power of self-denial, 
but through the power of a greater desire. Love for Jesus. So love comes first and love motivates us to keep his commands. So this morning Jesus is asking each one of us, do you love me? Does it show in your life? Do you obey my teachings? Do you put me first? Do you love me more than these, more than anything else? And as I've been challenged about that question, my honest answer is yes, but no. Not like that. Not as I should. Not as much as you deserve. And maybe that's your answer this morning too. And if it is, we are in good company because I think that was Peter's answer as well. And we'll see that as we delve a little bit deeper into uh, the wording of these verses. And we can learn a lot from how Jesus dealt with Peter. So the gospel is translated from Greek. And in the Greek, there are four words for love. So they all have slightly different meanings, but because there's only one word for love in English, they're all translated love. And two of them are used in this passage. So the first one is agape. And agape love is like the highest love. It's spiritual love, it's sacrificial love, it's an all-giving love. It's the love that Jesus has for us. And then the other word used is philia which means more brotherly, sisterly love, a love between friends. So if we look again at verses 15 to 17, we can see that when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus uses the word agape. He asked, do you love me with the highest love? Do you agape me? And Peter answers, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he uses the word philia. He says, yes, I do love you, but he takes it down a bit, takes it down a notch. He's honest about where he is. He's like, you know me. You know. You know that I have failed you. You know that I have denied you three times. You know that my heart's desire is to love you with an agape love, but you also know that I'm not there. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs. He's still going to use Peter. He still gives him a job to do. He's still going to use him to build his church. And maybe Peter's in a better position now to build his church because he's humble. He's aware of his weaknesses and his failings. And he's being honest with Jesus about them. And then again in verse 16... Jesus says, Simon, John of, son of John, do you love me? And he uses the word agape. And again, Peter takes it down a notch and uses the word philia. But then the third time, Jesus also uses the word philia. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So by using the word philia this time, it's as if Jesus is saying, okay, I can work with that. He's coming down to where Peter is. He accepts Peter as he is, where he is in his love for him and is still using him, still working with him and through him and in him. He knows Peter and he knows his desire to love him, but he also knows his failures. And so it is with us. If our answer to do do you love me is yes, but no, I'm not where I want to be. Jesus meets us where we are. He meets us in that place of wanting to love him more, but knowing that we're not where we should be. That's the grace and the love that Jesus has for us. He accepts us as we are and loves us as we are and uses us as we are. And that doesn't mean that we should be happy to stay there. It doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to be better. But we're not on our own with that. We have Christ in us. 
We have the Holy Spirit. We have the church. We have each other to inspire and encourage us. And then I just want to look at verses 18 and 19 as well. Because in verse 18, Peter goes on, uh, Jesus goes on and says, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. And when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And he basically tells Peter, when you're old, you're going to be crucified for your faith in me. And we know from church history that that is what happened. And before, when I've read this ver- these verses, I've kind of been reading 15 to 17 going, well, that's, you know, it's really lovely. Jesus is being gentle with Peter. He's restoring him. He's forgiving him. And then he says, truly, I tell you, this is really important. One day you're going to be crucified for me. And I'm like, whoa, that's brutal. Why would he say that? Why would he suddenly tell Peter that he's going to be crucified? Surely Peter doesn't want to hear that. But actually, having delved a bit more deeply, I think that's exactly what Peter needs to hear. And actually, that's good news for Peter. Because Peter has denied Jesus. Peter has said that before Jesus was arrested that he would die for him. He wanted to be there. He wanted to have that agape love, but he had failed And he had denied him. And we're told he wept bitterly. And here we are on the beach. And again, he wants to have that agape love, but he knows he doesn't. He's aware of his failures. His denial, his failure is really fresh in his mind. And he's probably really scared of failing again, of doing exactly the same thing again. And Jesus is saying, I know your heart and I know where you are. And I'm telling you that actually, one day, you will have that agape love for me and you will die for me. And can you see how that is good news for Peter, that he's not going to fail again? How reassuring that must have been for him. And it's good news for us too. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Even if we love him a little, Jesus meets us where we are, with our divided hearts, with our mixed motives, with our messed up lives and in all our failures. He meets us where we are and he will work with us and in us and through us to eventually present us holy and faultless before God. So Jesus is asking us this morning, each one of us, do you love me? And if you've answered yes for the first time today, then please speak to somebody about that before you leave. Somebody who's with you, somebody on the prayer ministry team, come and speak to me. I'd love to speak more about Jesus with you. And if you're online, please get in touch. And if, like me, your answer is yes, but no, not as much as I know I should, not as much as I want to, then know that Jesus meets you where you are. He's full of grace and love. He knows you, and like he did with Peter, he starts from where you are and will work in you and through you and with you. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen.